All right. Uh, before we start chemistry today, there's a few announcements related to exam reviews and things of that sort. So there will be a midterm three or exam three review is going to be next Friday. So it's going to be Friday. That'd be the 21st. 3 p.m., same room as always. Okay, so we're going to do same same story. And then the uh, questions that I'll go over for that were just posted this morning, so you have time to look over those ahead of time if that helps you. So it's going to be Friday, April 21st. Um, we are getting near the end of the semester, as you guys are all aware. Uh, so a couple things about that. Next week will be a full week of you know new material related to chapter nine just a little bit of that will be on the third exam most of that's not going to be until the final i'll let you know the exact cutoff when we get to it um but another important point is that we're going to probably have a maybe one extra day so that's going to be on what would that be the april 24th which is the first day of the exam so i'm sure a lot of you won't be here anyway um, but on april 24th if everything goes well next week, we're going to be pretty much through all the stuff we have to cover. So that's going to be kind of an extra day. So if you want me to go over anything in particular, send some requests, and I'll just review any topic that you think requires review. Obviously, I can't accommodate 500 requests, but I don't expect, expect that I'll get that many. So if you have anything, just let me know. Um, and that way, we'll have sort of an extra day to review whatever, uh, depending on how things go next week. And then for the final exam review, that's going to be in class because we have some extra days. The, the final exam review, which isn't posted yet, and you're probably not thinking about it just yet, um, that's going to be three parts, and it's going to be April 20, I'm sure I gave a date, sorry, the 26th, April 28th, and then the last day of class, which is May 1st, I think. So all that's going to be in class. You don't have to make a separate time to, to come do a review for the final exam. And I'll have those questions posted probably next week, a week in advance of that. So um, we're going to, you know, everything's coming pretty fast now at the end of the semester. So obviously the first order of business is the third midterm. And then after that, we'll start gearing up for the final exam, which comes right after that. All right, but we're not quite there yet because we have some more things to, to go over. And, and what we're going to talk about today are structures of metals. So last time we talked about some of their key properties, and then uh, we closed with sort of an introduction to Bragg's Law, which is the experimental basis by which we determine the structures. We don't need to familiarize ourselves with that many details of that, but now that we kind of have that uh, understanding, let's talk about what the structures of metals are. So most of the structures we're going to talk about are cubic in shape. So as I said, we have a, a crystalline structure, you have what's called the unit cell which is the smallest unit that repeats in all directions to give you the, the overall crystal structure. And most of the unit cells are gonna, that we're going to talk about are cubic in shape. There's probably at least eight or ten different types of unit cells in total, but we're only going to talk about a couple of simple ones, uh, mainly cubic. So when you have a cubic unit cell, you're going to put atoms or ions on various positions on that cube. And we want to first understand, you know, how do we count atoms or ions that are on a cube? Because remember that when we generate a crystal, we take this cube and we put it in all directions. We have we stack them in all directions next to each other. So depending on where the atom is on this cube, it's going to be either belonging complete to this unit cell or it's going to be shared by more than one unit cell. So the simplest one is body center. If we put an atom or an ion directly in the center of the cube, it's not going to be shared with any other unit cell. It completely resides within that cell. And so when we're counting atoms to figure out you know, the stoichiometry of our compound or whatever the case is, this counts as one. Okay? Now, other places we can put atoms on a cube, they're going to be shared by more than one cube. So if you put an atom on the face, so that's going to be right on one of the square faces of the cube, we call that a face center position. And in this case, this atom is going to also be shared with the unit cell that's directly next to it. So there's two cubes stacked next to each other, and the atom sort of lies in the middle between them on the face. And so a face center position is shared by two unit cells. And so when we count it, it only counts as half of an atom for that cell. All right, so any, any atom that lies on the face position is shared by two cells. 
So when you're counting the atoms that are in that specific unit cell, you count it as one half. We also have edge positions. And so edge positions, as the name implies, you have an atom that sits right on the edge. And this is going to be shared by four different cells. So again, if we were, if we were to imagine stacking cubes in all, you know, in all directions, making a stack of cubes, any edge position is going to have four around it. You're going to have you know, one in this direction, one in this direction, and the, the, the two other corners as well. So you're going to have four total cells that are sharing it. That one's a little bit hard to visualize, but if you were to dig out your old set of blocks from when you were a kid and stack them, you'd see that an edge position borders four different unit cells. And so we count it as one fourth. And then finally, the last place we can put an atom is directly in the corner of the cube, in the corner of the unit cell. So this one, again, a little bit hard to visualize, but it's going to be shared by eight different unit cells. You have the four that are going to be above the one that I show you here, and then the one that I'm showing, plus three others that are sort of below. So you have you know, four above, four below, the atom's going to be uh, between eight of them. So each corner is bordered by eight unit cells, so we're going to count, by, count that as one eighth. All right, so that's sort of an important starting point as we go through some of the different types of unit cells and talk about how many atoms are in those cells, and especially when we start talking about ionic compounds, how many of each ion are in the cell, which have to, of course, have balanced charges and all that. All right, so that's how we count atoms or ions that are in, in cubic cells. Now let's start talking about the different types of cubic structures we can have, and there's going to be three that we're going to go through. Now I am going to give you guys a lot of details today just because... Um, Partly because I think this stuff is interesting, um, and I think it helps you understand it if I go through a lot of these details. But we're not going to help hold you responsible for many of those, so I'll give you sort of a summary at the end of what you're really responsible for. But I think it is helpful to try to understand how these structures are built up and some of their key features. So how do we build a simple cubic structure? So a simple cubic structure is one where we have a cube and we just have one atom in every corner, and that's it. So the way we can build that is we start with a layer of atoms where they're all touching. Put them as close to each other as possible. And then to build a cubic structure, we just stack more layers on top of that where they're exactly on top of each other, completely eclipsing one another. So the rest of the layers of atoms are stacked directly on top. All right, and so then if we look at sort of the, the cubic part of this, if we just take out one cubic piece that's going to be repeated in all directions, this is what the simple cubic structure looks like. It has one atom at each corner. Now, in reality, those atoms are placed as close to, uh, to each other as possible, where they're basically touching. So in a space-filling model, it's going to look like this, where all the atoms are touching each other along each edge. And then if we take this unicell and we build it up in all directions, if we translate it in all directions to build a lattice, you get a, a simple cubic lattice that starts to look like this and goes on and on and on forever. Um, but a simple cubic structure, again, pretty, pretty basic. You just have one atom in each corner of the cube. Now, one couple features we're going to talk about related to these different structures, and one of them is some relationships involving the length of the side of a cube. So remember that a cube is... You know, all the sides have the same length, and they're all 90 degree angles. And we want to define the length of each side in terms of the atomic radius that's in the structure. And then that's going to help us define what's called a packing efficiency, which we'll define here at the bottom, which is basically the total percentage of the space that's occupied by the atoms versus the empty space. Because as you notice, when we have a simple cubic structure, you have some empty space in there because you can't pack spheres exactly close together and fill up all the volume of the cube, which is not possible. So we're going to define how much empty space there is. And again, these types of derivations that we're doing are not going to be something you have to reproduce on a test, but I think it does help you understand where all this stuff comes from. So for this one, it, the, the geometry, we're going to go back toward of, sort of the high school geometry. I'm assuming um, you guys also geometry in high school. I know I had to. Um, and we're going to sort of use some geometric arguments to, to build some relationships between 
the lengths of the sides of the, of the cube and also the, the radius of the atoms that's occupying them. So this one's pretty straightforward because if we have the length of a side is going to be abbreviated with the, the letter A. So when you do when you when you define different crystal structures, the length of the sides are A, B, and C. For a cubic structure, you only have one length because they're all the same, so you just call it A. And then this one, if we look at two atoms in the corner touching each other, we have the radius of one atom that takes up half of it, the radius of a second atom that takes up the other half. So the length of a side is going to be equal to two times the atomic radius of whatever atom is in there. So A is equal to two R. Now using um, you know, more geometry concepts, if we want to find the volume of the cube, that's just going to be A cubed, so just cube the side length, so we, which is 2R cubed, which is also, we can write 8R cubed. All right, so the volume of the cube is 8 times the atomic radius raised to the third power. Now the other thing we need to do when we're working down to the bottom here to get packing efficiency is how many total spheres are there in one unit cell? So as we talked about, in the, in the simple cubic structure, all you have is one atom on each corner. So there are eight corners. Each of those eight corners is shared by eight unit cells, so each one counts as one-eighth. So for corner atoms, remember, there's the count is one-eighth, and there's a total of eight, and that's all we have in this structure. So in net, we just have one atom per unit cell. In reality, it's eight one-eighths of an atom, but in, no, in total, it's just one atom per unit cell when we count it up that way. So then the volume of the atoms themselves, volume of a sphere is 4 thirds pi r cubed, so we have one atom with a volume of 4 thirds pi r cubed. All right, so this is the volume occupied by the atoms, this is the volume of the cube itself. And if we wanted to find a packing efficiency, which is the percentage of the volume that's occupied by the atoms, what we do is we take that ratio, volume of the spheres, or the atoms in this case, divided by the volume of the cube, and we multiply that by 100 to get a percent. So it's 4 thirds pi r cubed, which is the volume of the atoms. And then we saw that 8, pi, 8 r cubed is the volume of the cube itself. And so no matter what the radius is, that, that divides out, we get pi over 6 times 100, which is 52.4%. So in a simple cubic structure, 52.4% of the volume is occupied by the atoms, the rest of it is empty space, so roughly half and half. All right, so that's the packing efficiency for a simple cubic structure. All right, any questions on that before we move on to some slightly more complicated ones? It'll get, it'll get much worse, but a little bit more. Okay, so, yeah? So the 8 is taking, the side length is 2 times the radius, and then we cube that. So we, we cube the whole thing, 2R, whole thing cubed, that gives you 8R cubed. No, so in, that, in this case, 8 just comes from the equation in front. You're talking about this 8 here? That's because there's 8 corners in a cube. So that's the total number of corners, and then each corner has 1 eighth of an atom at it, because it's shared by 8 other, or sorry, by 7 other unit cells. Yeah, so this 8 comes from the fact that there are 8 corners and that each one of them has an atom at it. Okay? All right, now moving on to body center cubic. So in this case, what we have is when we, when we generate the layered structure, we have sort of alternating layers. So first we start with a layer of atoms that have a, a space in between them. So the first layer, they're all lined up but with a small space in between. And then for the second layer, which I'm showing in red, we're going to stagger it relative to the first. So the second layer is going to be placed such that the atoms lie in the spaces in the, in the first layer. Okay, so that's what we call a staggered, uh, you know, stacking arrangement. So we, we stack the second layer over the spaces in the first. And then 
for the third one, we're going to just stack this so that it's completely on top of the first. So they're going to be, it's going to eclipse the first layer and then fill in the spaces that are generated by the second layer. So when we have this type of packing where we take one layer and then we stack on a different layer which is shifted relative to that and then we stack on the same layer again we call this ABA packing and that's because again there's only alternating layers AB, AB, AB where the, you know, the first layer is this one, the second layer fills the spaces and then the third layer is exactly the same as this, just stacked up from it. So we call that ABA when you have that type of packing. The other one, I guess, would have just been called AA packing if we wanted to give it a name because it's just the same type of layer. Um, all right, so that's going to be how we, how we generate a body center cubic structure. And if we take the cubic piece out of that, what you have in this situation is an atom in every corner and now one and more in the center. So that's why we call it body centered cubic. There's one more atom that completely resides in the center of the cube. Again, if you look at a space filling model, the atoms come as close to each other as possible so that all these corner atoms are directly neighboring the atom that's in the center. If we take this body center cubic structure and we translate it in all directions, we get a lattice that looks a bit more complicated because each unit cell now has an additional atom that's in the center. Okay, So that's what the body center cubic structure looks like. This is probably the best way to visualize it. Just eight corners with an atom on it, one more in the center. So if we start doing all the same thing we did last time, things are a little bit more complicated in this case. Um, so in, in this situation, we don't have atoms touching along the side of a, of a cube. We have the atoms touching along the diagonal of the cube. So if we go from one corner to the complete opposite corner through the diagonal of the cube, we have an atom in the corner, an atom in the center, and then another atom in this corner. All right. So the length of a cube diagonal, which is, I'm going to abbreviate D, is going to be A squared plus A squared plus A squared. So again, this is geometry. If you have a cube and you want to find the length of the di diagonal, you just add up the squares of the sides. And so that means the length of the diagonal is going to be A times the square root of 3 if we solve for it. All right, so that's, that's the relationship between the diagonal and the length of a side. Now the other thing we can look at is... how many atomic radiuses does that include? So if we go from one corner to the complete opposite corner, we have one atom in the corner with a radius r. We have the atom in the center. And we have to go through 2r, with the whole diameter of that atom, which is in the center. And then we go through the radius of the other atom that's in the opposite corner. So the length of the diagonal in this case, in terms of the radius, is four times the radius. Okay, so that's a little bit harder to see. This is, the more, this is the most complicated one to see. But we have to go from corner to corner, and as we go from corner to corner, we go through four atomic radii. One in the corner, two atomic radii to get through the center atom, and then one more in the opposite corner, total of 4r. So if we solve for a in terms of the radius, it's going to be 4r divided by the square root of 3. All right, and then the next step, of course, to define the packing efficiency is we need to know how many total atoms are there in the unit cell. So in this case, we still have eight corners, and each of those corners counts as one-eighth. But we also have one atom that's completely in the center of the cube. Remember that that one's not shared with any other neighboring unit cell. So we have one center atom, which counts as one. And so in total, we have two atoms per unit cell in this structure. We only had one atom per unit cell on the simple cubic. Now by putting one more in the center, we have a total of two. So if we want the volume of the spheres, or the volume of the atoms themselves, there are two atoms, and each of them has a volume of four-thirds pi r cubed. So the total volume of the atoms in the unit cell is two times the, 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 the volume of each. So we get eight-thirds pi r cubed. And again, to do the packing efficiency, we divide the volume of the spheres divided by the volume of the cube itself. So the volume of the cube is going to be this cubed. Take the side length and cube it. The volume of the spheres is given here. So we're going to take 
8 thirds pi r cubed and then divide it by 4 over radical 3 r quantity cubed so that radius is divided out again All right, and so if we put this numerically, we get 68%. All right, so in this case, the packing efficiency is a little bit higher. We have more, a larger percentage of the space occupied by the atoms, and that kind of makes sense because we stuff the whole other atom in the center of that cube. All right, now we don't get a, a huge gain in the efficiency because in order to do this, we had to spread out those corner atoms a little bit, so they're no longer touching each other. So you had to sort of expand out the structure a little bit, but then you were able to put one in the middle. So overall, you get an increase in packing efficiency is 68%. The last cubic structure we're going to talk about is face-centered cubic. All right, this one, the layered structure is, is, is a bit more complex. So in this case, we start with a close-packed layer of spheres. That means we're going to start with a layer of spheres where they're as close to each other as possible. All right, and so that the way you do that is you fill in one row and then you fill in the next row that's staggered to that to sort of fill in the dimples of the first row and so on. So this is putting them as close together as possible. Um, again, if you think about it in terms of, you know, marbles, how, you know, what's the closest you can lay a bunch of marbles next to each other? It looks like this. So this is what's called a close packed layer of, of spheres. So that's sort of the starting point. All right, so we'll call this first layer A, the yellow one. And then we're going to take the second layer and we're going to stack it so it sort of goes over the dimples in the first layer. So you see the, each close pack layer has these little triangular shaped dimples here. The second layer is going to go right on top of those. And so we're going to call that layer the B layer, which is shown in blue. And then the third layer is still going to be staggered relative to that. So we call that the C layer. So the third layer goes over the dimples in the second layer, and then it's not until we get to the fourth layer that we actually repeat one. So we call this A, B, C, A packing. So you'll see it referred to as either A, B, C, or A, B, C, A packing. And again, all that tells us is how the structure is generated. It's not terribly important for understanding a lot of the key properties, but if we want to generate this structure from a, a bunch of layers of atoms, we have to stack them in an A, B, C fashion, where the first layer we lay down, the second layer we lay down staggered relative to that, the third layer is still staggered relative to the second layer, and then finally the fourth layer goes completely on top of the first layer, A, B, C, A. All right. There's a bunch of different ways of visualizing this structure, which I've put here to sort of help you. Now as it turns out, these layers sort of lie along the diagonal of the cube, so in terms of visualizing the cubic part of the structure, that's not the easiest way to do it is with layers. But if we look at the cubes that are shown over here, this is probably the, the better way to do it. We call this face-centered cubic because in this case, we have one atom in each corner, and we also have one atom at the center of each face. So there's a total of six faces on a cube, and each one of them has an atom in the center of it. The space filling model helps you see that too. Each one has a corner, and then each face has an atom sort of stuck right in the middle of it. So this is called face-centered cubic. And now let's talk about the packing efficiency for this one and some of the geometric aspects. All right, so in this case, if we go along the face of a cube, we have the atoms sort of arranged like so. So remember that each side length we call A. And as we go along the diagonal of the face, that's what we're going to go through one radius to get to there, two, two R to get through the face centered position, and another radius to get to that corner. So a total, again, of 4R, but this time it's along the diagonal of the face, not along the diagonal of the cube. So the length of a face diagonal is given by this. It's just a two-dimensional equivalent of the, the last one we did. So the diagonal of the face is going to be A times the square root of 2. That's, again, Pythagorean theorem or whatever you call it in geometry. Um, so that's just uh, using the, the side lines to calculate the length of a diagonal. And we know, again, from... The diagonal is a square root of 2 is going to be equal to 4 times the radius. So as we go through this diagonal, we travel through 4 atomic radii. 
So we have this relationship, and then again, we've solved for A in terms of the atomic radius for R over radical 2, which a more conventional way to write this is 2 radical 2R. Okay? So this is the relationship between the side length and the atomic radius for this structure. Again, they're all a little bit different because of how the, the atoms are arranged. Now, for this one, count the number of atoms per unit cell. We still have eight corners with one-eighth of an atom in each, so that doesn't change. And then we have the faces. And remember that there's six total faces in a cube. And each one of those counts as one half. Okay, because each face is shared by two different cubes that are right next to each other. So in total, we have four atoms in the unit cell for a face-centered cubic. Eight times one-eighth is one, and then six halves is another three. So a total of four. So when we calculate the volume of the atoms, it's going to be four atoms, and then each one has a volume of four-thirds pi r cubed, which comes out to 16 thirds pi r cubed. All right, four atoms, each, each volume is four-thirds pi r cubed, and now we can do the same thing. Packing efficiency is the volume of the atoms divided by the volume of the unit cell. 16 over three pi r cubed divided by, and then in this case, the length of the side is 2 radical 2r, so we cube that to get the volume of the unit cell. Alright, so this one comes out to 74.0%. Alright, so that's the most efficient packing arrangement of the three cubic structures we're going to talk about. Okay, so those are the three different cubic structures, and different metals are going to crystallize in different ones of those, as we'll see. The last one we'll talk about, but not in a lot of detail, is hexagonal close packing. So in this case, we're still taking a close pack layer of spheres, but we're packing it in an ABA fashion. All right, so in this case, we're not going to be Eclipse, we're not going to be staggering three layers, we're only going to be staggering two layers. So we start with a close pack arrangement, the, the, again they're as close to each other as possible. We stack the second layer on top of the divots in the first layer, and then we stack the third layer exactly on top of the first layer. So it's called AB or ABA packing, but it's, it's, it's using a close pack layer of atoms. All right, and this one we're not going to do as much with because it's hexagonal and it's, it's a lot more difficult to, to visualize. Um, so it doesn't have a cubic shape in the unit cell. It has sort of this hexagonal shape is one way to arrange it. Or if you take just a piece of that and translate it, it's sort of this oblique kind of thing. So it's, it's a lot more, uh, a lot less friendly to visualize. But we can just talk about a little bit of a as few aspects of it. So first is the number of atoms. So we have, if we look at this view of it here, we have these hexagonal layers of atoms. And so you have a, these six atoms are shared by a total of six unit cells. A little bit harder to visualize in this case. And then so there's this layer that's shared by six and this layer that's shared by another six. So you have a total of 12 atoms that are shared by one by, that are shared by six unit cells each, so 12 times one sixth. We have the ones that I'm showing in blue here, which are a little bit harder to see in this view. Those three are completely encapsulated in the unit cell. They're not shared by any, so you have three that are not shared. And then we have these two atoms in the middle of the hexagon, one on top and one at the bottom, that are shared by two unit cells that are stacked on top of each other. So you have two atoms that are shared with two, so two times a half. So anyway, you get a total of six atoms per unit cell. You're not going to be responsible for calculating atomic positions in a hexagonal cell. I just want to give that to you to, to round it out. Um, basically, all you need to know about hexagonal unit cell is that it's, it has the exact same packing efficiency as the face center cubic. All right, so there are two unit cells that are considered close packed arrangements. One is the face center cubic, which is ABCA packing. And if you take those same layers and stack them in a slightly different way, ABA packing, 
you get a hexagonal unit cell that has the exact same packing efficiency, 74%, just a different shape for the unit cell. So we don't want you to worry about too many details about the hexagonal structures because they're a lot more difficult to visualize and the geometry is a lot more complicated because you're no longer dealing with right angles like you are in the cubic cells. So we're not going to talk in any more detail about this, but just be aware that it's an alternative structure that has the exact same packing efficiency as face centered cubic. Now the last thing we need to talk about is what's called coordination number. So this is another feature of the, of the structures that we're going to deal with. So the coordination number is, as a definition, it's the number of nearest neighbors in a crystal. So it's the number of atoms that another one is touching. So if we look at a single atom in a crystal structure, and we ask ourselves, how many total no nearest neighbors does it have? The ones that are closest to it, or the ones that you can think of as it's bordering up against or touching? And that number is also going to be different for all of these different structures. Okay, so let's look at simple cubic. Now, now coordination number, we can define it for any simple structure. We're going to start with these are just metallic structures, things that only have one type of atom in it. We'll talk about ionic structures later. Coordination number is a little bit more important for those. But for now, let's just define it for these three basic structure types. All right, so if we have a simple cubic structure, let's count how many nearest neighbors each one has. All right, so I'll do this in red so it contrasts a little bit. All right, so let's look at this atom here, which I'll mark with an X. And we want to know how many nearest neighbors, how many other atoms is it touching? Okay, so it has four that are in the same layer that are touching it. And then we have one atom that's above it in the layer that's above, and one atom below that's in the layer below that are also completely touching the, the same one. So if, we stack, if you imagine now we take a bunch of these layers and stack them, this one is going to also be sandwiched between two other layers, one above and one below, where it's going to have one neighbor in each of those layers. So it's harder, harder for me to show that, but you have one above and below. We can try to mark that here. It's going to be a little bit hard to see, but if you have this one in the middle here, it's going to have one, two, three, four, five, six nearest neighbors. So if you look at the extended structure, you can see that. But if you look at the layer structure, it's going to be four atoms that are in the same layer, one atom that's in the layer above, one that's in the layer below. So a total of six nearest neighbors. So the coordination number CN is equal to six for this simple cubic structure. <coughs> All right, and then we have to do body center cubic. And this one actually is pretty straightforward to visualize because all, all we have to do for this one is just look at one individual unit cell. So if we focus on the atom in the center, this one here, how many nearest neighbors does it have? It's going to be all the atoms that are in the corners of the cell that it's residing inside of. So you have three, eight corners, all the same distance from that center atom. So pretty straightforwardly, the coordination number for body center cubic is eight. There are eight nearest neighbors, and those are going to be the ones that are in the corner. Um, all of the positions, it may, not, it may not be obvious, but if you extend this in all directions, all of these atoms are going to have a coordination number of 8. So there's not two different coordination numbers, it's just one coordination number. Everything is a coordination number of 8. It's easiest to see if you focus in on the center atom here. <clears throat> Alright, and then we finally, uh, we come to our, our last one, the closest packing structures, which are either going to be face centered cubic or hexagonal. They have the same coordination number. Um, so let's see how we get that. All right, so if we focus on this atom here, which I'll mark with an X, this hollow blue one here, six of the nearest neighbors are very easy to spot. You have one, two, three, four, five, six. So you have six in the same layer that are touching it. But then how many other ones do we have that are the same distance away? A little bit harder to see. So we have, in the layer below it, we have three that are touching. We have that yellow one there, that yellow one there, and that yellow one there. And then we have another layer above, which is going to be, if this is the atom we're thinking about, 
you have. All right, so remember that in these, in these close packed structures, each layer sits in the divots of the other layer. So there's three atoms that, that form that triangular shaped divot. So there's going to be six in the same layer, three below it that it sits in the divot of, three above it, and that's going to give you a total of 12. All right, and this one sort of, oh, I don't, where did that picture go? I'll try to put it in here. I had another picture in here that was even clearer and it disappeared from these notes. That's unfortunate. Is it in the ones that I posted on Blackboard? No. Okay, I'll, I'll, tr I'll put that back in there if I remember. Um, there's, a, there's another picture. It might be in your book. I'll try to remind myself. That shows the layered structure from the side view where you can clearly see that there's a total of 12 nearest neighbors. Six in the same layer, three above, three below. It helps you see it a little bit better. Okay, so those are the coordination numbers for those. All right, so that gives us a sort of a summary then of everything we have to know. So this is, there's a lot of details here. Um, this is you know kind of some far out stuff, a lot different than we've done before. But really, if you can learn the information that's in this table, this is what you really need to, to do for, for homework questions and test questions. Okay? All right, so summary of the metallic structure types. We have four that we have to worry about. Um, simple cubic, body-centered cubic, face-centered cubic, and hexagonal. They all have some abbreviations associated with them or some other synonyms that you want to be aware of just in case we give those to you. So simple cubic is also called primitive cubic. Okay, body-centered cubic has an abbreviation BCC. Face-centered cubic has two abbreviations, one of them is pretty obvious, FCC, but there's another abbreviation for face center cubic that's called CCP, and that means cubic close packed. So that's the cubic structure where the atoms are packed as close together as possible, so we also call it cubic close packed. And then hexagonal is abbreviated HCP, which is hexagonal close packed, or closest packed. So that means, again, it's a hexagonal structure where the atoms are packed as close together as possible, you get the highest packing densities for those. All right, another important parameter we talked about is the number of atoms per unit cell, which if we learn the counting rules that we learned on the first slide, we can do that pretty easily for the cubic structures. We came up with a total of one atom per unit cell in the primitive cubic, two for the body center cubic, four for the face center cubic, and then the, least, the less obvious one that we're not going to really worry about the derivation of is hexagonal, which has six atoms per unit cell. And then the last thing we just talked about was coordination number, which is the number of nearest neighbors, and we have... 6 for primitive cubic, 8 for body center cubic, 12 and 12 for hexagonal. And what we'll see then is that this packing efficiency that we, we derive is going to be dependent on the coordination number. There's a sort of a direct relationship between them. So for simple cubic it was 52.4%. For body center cubic it was 68%. And then for face center cubic 74.0% and hexagonal is the same. So the packing efficiency goes up as we increase the coordination number and as we increase the number of atoms per unit cell, which makes at least a little bit of intuitive sense. All right, so you definitely want to become familiar with some of these numbers and some of these features and differences, and you'll see when, we, when you start doing homework questions on this topic that we don't go into a lot of depth. If you can count the atoms in the, in the structure and if you can you know, know some of these differences between them, that's as far as we're going to go. Um, so the last thing we're going to do today is one practice problem that's probably more complicated than you'll need to do. I don't want to um, make that promise, but you know, we're not going to like to give you anything this detailed. But it helps us understand, you know, how can we use this information to understand certain properties of substances? You know, what's, what's really the point of, 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 all, of everything that I talked about today, which I may have not give, you know, explained to you very well. So one thing we can do with this information, there's a lot of things we can do with it, but one important thing is we can calculate the density of any material. If we know the structure of the material and we know how far apart all the atoms are in the structure, we can calculate a density for that. All right, so we have sodium crystallizes in a body-centered cubic structure with a side length of 429 picometers. Picometers is 10 to the minus 12 meters. That's usually the unit we use for describing atomic radii or, or things related to that. And then we want to calculate the density of sodium in grams per cubic centimeter. All right, so believe it or not, that information is enough to calculate the density of, of this metal sodium, um, which, let's see how that works. Okay, so remember the, the definition of density is mass per volume. 
And so for an individual unit cell, what we want to find is how many grams of sodium are in that unit cell, and then what's the volume of that unit cell in cubic centimeters. All right, so we have the information for one unit cell. We know how big the cell is, 429 picometers on each side, and then we have to calculate the mass of sodium that's in the cell and divide that by the volume. All right, so the first thing we can do is the mass of sodium, and this uses a bunch of conversions and calculations that we learned back in chapter five. All right, so if we're gonna look for the mass of sodium in one unit cell, the first thing is how many atoms of sodium are in this body-centered cubic unit cell? So we saw that when we went through it that there are two sodium atoms per unit cell. And now let's calculate the mass in grams of two sodium atoms. So the way we do this is we convert to moles first. Remember that the atomic mass is related to moles of substance. So we divide by Avogadro's number to get moles of sodium in one unit cell, a very small number of course, because there's only two atoms total. And now that we have moles of sodium, we can calculate the grams of sodium using the atomic mass. So we go to the periodic table, we find that the atomic mass of sodium is 22.99. So we get 7.64 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams. All right, so again, a very small number because there's only two total sodium atoms but that's the mass of two sodium atoms, which we use sort of two conversions to get to. All right? Now the other thing we need to do is calculate the volume. So remember that as we talked about today, the volume is just the length of the side cubed. That's the volume of any cube. So we, we're told that the length of the side is 429 picometers. We cube that whole thing and we get 7.90 times 10 to the seventh cubic picometers. Now that's clearly not the unit that we need because we want the density in grams per cubic centimeter, so we need to convert this volume into cubic centimeters. All right? So we have 7.9 times 10 to the seventh picometers cubed, and then we want to convert that into centimeters, so we can do that in a two-step process. First, let's convert to meters. So remember that pico means 10 to the minus 12, so one meter has 10 to the 12 picometers. Now because it's a cubic picometer, we have to cube the conversion factor. So we haven't really seen that in any of the types of things that we've done, but whenever you have a unit that's cubed, if you're using a conversion factor, you have to cube the whole thing too, because we want all of these picometers to cancel out. So we cube that, and then we do, again, 100 centimeters per meter but we have to cube that whole thing as well because everything's cubed in this unit. And so when we work that out, we get 7.90 times 10 to the minus 23rd cubic centimeters. All right, so we just took this number here and converted it to cubic centimeters. Let me add another page because I'm running out of room. All right, and then finally, the last thing to do is just to divide the two to get the density. All right, so the density is going to be, we found that there was, once it writes, lets me write again, 7.64 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams of sodium in one unit cell. The volume we just calculated in cubic centimeters was 7.90 times 10 to the minus 23rd. And so using this information, we calculated density of 0 0.967 grams per cubic centimeter. Okay, now if we go to our favorite internet resource, Wikipedia, and look up the measured density of sodium to convince you that this works, the density is 0 0.968, so very close to what we got. All right, so this shows that we can use the crystal structure to calculate density once we know a lot of the properties of it. All right, but like I said, we're probably not going to see the type of calculation, but it helps you understand what we can do with this information. Next week, we'll start talking about some more types of structures for other types of compounds.